صباح الخير Hello. Okay. Either uh, through an intercostal approach or through a subcostal approach. The subcostal approach means below the ribs, and this is you know, a nice place to check the kidneys, whether longitudinal or transverse. The intercostal approach is much better for the transverse. Okay, so we use both approaches, not just one. I should use a transducer according to the patient's body weight. If there's lots of fat, then I should use a, a, a lower depth. If not, uh, up to five megahertz is acceptable. Damon, I should give a proper LS, including both poles. I should use a perpendicular beam. Yani, the probe should be perpendicular to the body in the subcostal region. To obtain a TS is very importantly, I to display the pelvis. If this is how, this is a demo of where we should place the probe if I want a TS position. Yeah, I'm sorry, go back, go back, sorry. Back, all right, another back, another back, all right. Um, this is, a proper TS position, the probe should, should be in the subcostal region or intercostal just above it if, I, if that needs be. And then I can see the kidney with the pelvis evident. This is the longitudinal position. As you can see, the beams should be perpendicular to the kidney for proper visual, visualization of both poles of the kidney. That is very important to measure the kidney size. Next, I could place the patient in a lateral position and use the probe in a coronal view, which means I could tilt the probe slightly towards the head of the patient. This will give me the opportunity to show the kidney in proper light. But both ends are vis visualized. I can see the medullary pyramids that look like beads. And I, in the uh, transverse position, I can see the collecting system properly. Another demonstration, it's really important to know where to place my probe, how my hand should be placed, okay? And then when I place the probe in this position, oh my God, then I could angle it up and down or slide the probe slightly, all right? The normal kidney, as we all know, is being shaped. It's bilateral. The patient should be lie in the supine uh, position and take a deep breath. The kidney is either isoechoic or slightly hypoechoic to the liver and has a hyperechoic center. The hyperechoic center is due to the refraction of the beams uh, on the vascular structures, uh, walls, and the walls of the collecting ducts. The normal difference between both kidneys should not exceed 2 cm. All right. Another view of the LS of the kidney. I can see my pyramids. Well, say my Dr. Norman L and he improved in that. He said, in the D colasma parenchyma, like in D is the cortex, I can see my capsule as a very thin hyperechoic line. My cortex should be hyperechoic, slightly uh, uh, iso or slightly hypoechoic than the liver and a hyperechoic center. Okay. Another visualization to check the medulla, the cortex, the pyramids, and the sinus. All right. This is where my probe should be perpendicular to the kidney. Very important to get such an image and another transverse uh, view and then measurements. Normally both poles of the kidney should be uh, seen and it would be so much better if the sinus was in the middle of both poles. And one pole should not be smaller in size than the other. I should see cortex of equal 
di uh, diameter on either side of the uh, parenchyma of the uh, sinus. This will give me good uh, measurement of the length. Normal length is uh, 10 to 12, normal width is 4 to 6, and the parenchyma is 13 to 25. Okay, then we're going to discuss abnormalities. Normal variations is also an abnormality, and the first one of them is the hypertrophic column of Britain. This column could uh, cause um, uh, confusion owing to the fact that it looks like a mass. <laughs> As a mass, all right? It could be partial or it could be complete. And in either case, it always looks and how am I going to differentiate it? One, that it looks as echogenic as the cortex next to it. So very rarely is a tumor as echogenic or equal in echogenicity as the uh, next the parenchyma right next to it. Normal variation. Second thing is a duplex kidney. A duplex kidney means that there are there is two kidneys, this is the first one, that are completely separated they, don't, they are confused, but separated in their collecting systems. Because a complete column of Bertin would give you an impression that these are two kidneys, but they're not, because they have the same collecting system. But these are two collecting systems. Okay, this is, this is one of them. This is another where you can see a collecting system and another one that is obstructed and therefore dilated. These are two collecting systems. An ectopic kidney is a kidney that you look for in its normal position, uh, infradiaphragmatic, and you don't find it. Then you should search in the pelvis. A pelvic kidney could be in between or right next to the bladder, like this one. This is the bladder, and here is an ectopic kidney. Usually, the kidney starts embryologically in the pelvis and rises huh, and slides up. But a pelvic kidney is a kidney that does, fails to do that. When it, when as it rises, it rotates. So a pelvic kidney is a malrotated kidney, right? This is an ectopic fused kidney, which we should not uh, confuse with a horseshoe kidney. A horseshoe kidney is a kidney that is uh, fused in its lower poles in front of the aorta and the IVC. And a horseshoe kidney is also malrotated. When rotated, the, medial, the, la the lower ends are rotated medially, and so the pelvic calicele system appears malrotated. I can see here, and here, and here. See that? All right. Lastly is the dromedary hump. This is a normal hump. This is not a tumor, even though it looks like one. I should not confuse it with a tumor. It usually is on the left side, and that is because as the kidney develops, it is pushed by the spleen. And so part of it, part of the cortex becomes a hump, all right? It's usually almost always the left kidney. Okay. Renal diseases, pathological renal diseases, we will start with the diffuse renal diseases. This, is, this means diffuse changes in echogenicity, which is a non-specific sign of parenchymal disorder. It, the parenchyma could be hypoechoic or hyperechoic compared to the normal side, or if bilateral compared to the liver or spleen, increased or decreased cortical medullary differentiation can also be present. And if uh, there is diffuse change, um, then it usually in the acute phase is uh, the kidney is enlarged and in the chronic phase, the kidney is shrunken. And as we can see here in acute tubular necrosis, the kidney is enlarged, hypoechogenic compared with the surroundings and to the other side, and with increased corticomedullary differentiation. And that is because the parenchyma became more hypoechoic, not because the sinus is hyperechogenic. This is one, and this is another, where we see in large size, there's some fluid here, and uh, uh, hyper, hi, uh, hypoechogenic. This one is an, a hyperechoic because in acute tumor necrosis, it can be either hypo or hyper. In acute granulophritis, it's always hyperechogenic and enlarged in size with a good you know, in decreased differentiation between the cortex and the medulla. In acute tubular necrosis, there's increased differentiation, but in acute gamma nephritis, there's decreased differentiation between cortex and medulla, okay? Because the kidney becomes hyperechogenic. In amyloidosis, the kidney is also enlarged with prominent papillae because the, the amyloidosis causes increased hyperechogenicity, so much the medullary pyramids appear very prominent, 
okay? And there's poor cortico medullary differentiation. Lastly, chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure, any cause of chronic renal uh, parenchymal disorder will lead to a small sized kidney, okay, with poor cortico medullary differentiation. Uh, and I have chosen to show you the, the three grades. This is an almost normal sized kidney, 98 by 35, but the, there's uh, decreased cortical thickness, as you can see, eight. This is um, second degree uh, because the echogenicity is much more than, than the first. This is slightly hyperechoic than, more markedly hyperechoic than, and this is a shrunken kidney with poor differentiation between cortex and medulla, thin atrophic uh, cortex, very small in size, as compared, as you can see, compared to the liver, and uh, there is a tiny cyst. One of the things that, that uh, denote chronicity and uh, uh, renal failure. But what causes diffuse uh, bilaterally enlarged kidney disease? The most important one is diabetic nephropathy, also adult polycystic kidney disease, which we'll see right now. The presence of malignancies, amyloidosis, and collagen vascular disorders. Small kidneys, of course, chronic renal failure, but chronic uh, reflux nephropathy would do that. Analgesic nephropathy would do that. Uh, Glory nephritis would also do that. Okay, moving on, we'll, we'll start by the simple cyst. Just as, as Dr. Nomen said, a simple cyst is a cyst that is anechoic, no content, sharp demarcation, smooth surface, and an enhancement beyond it. This is how I would diagnose a simple cyst. Posterior enhancement, sharp demarcation, smooth surface, and echoic. And the way that uh, simple cysts are differentiated from other cysts is the Bosniak classification system. It's used both in ultrasound and in CT, in both. The first one we just saw is a simple cyst. We just saw it. It has a hairline uh, thin wall, no cas septi classification or solid components. The second one different, is differentiated by the presence of few hairline thin septi or fine calcifications or a, a high attenuation of lesions inside. If there's a 2F, that means that the septi are multiple, not just few, or there's thickening of the wall, or there's a intrarenal non-enhancing high attenuated lesion. The third, there's a cystic mass. So not, and the fourth, there's a it's, of course, malignancy because you will find a soft tissue component. Let's check this out. This is hemorrhage within a cyst. Still, the cyst has a thin wall, still sharply demarcated, but there's content, most probably hemorrhage. But this is a complex cyst. As you can see, I would consider this a 2F because the septi are multiple and they are not hairline, all right? And so is this one. This cyst is a uh, type three, because as I can see, there's nodular calcification inside. This is not thin or fine calcification, okay? And this one, there is a solid component. I would consider this Bosniak four. This is a malignant cyst. The presence of a soft tissue component, thick wall, okay, and thick septi. This is one of the most common genetic disorders that persist into adulthood. This is a polycystic kidney disease. Polycystic kidney disease means that I have to prove that these cysts are variable in size, non-communicating, all right? Causing atrophy of the renal parenchyma and plus or minus the presence of content. Some of them so content, uh, which means echoes due to hemorrhage without, within the cyst or due to infection. Okay, and I, I've given you several Several examples, this is, for example, is a very large cyst. Sometimes one cyst could enlarge markedly and cause pain, pain, especially if hemorrhage occurs, all right? For different examples. For example, there's maintenance of a cortex here, early, late, no cortex. This is the capsule and no cortex can be seen. Okay, kidney inflammation. Acute pyelonephritis presents with an enlarged kidney that is echogenic, echogenic, all right? And there is haziness between the kidney parenchyma and the kidney sinus. You, you cannot really give a good differentiation because it's echogenic and poor differentiation. But in chronic pyelonephritis, what is evident is the presence of focal thinning of the cortex. This focal thinning 
would cause is due to the scar tissue, which is an echogenic, echogenic line that has to transverse the entire cortex. This then is a scar. And uh, here there are multiple echo scars and the kidney appears irregular. If I see an irregular outline of the kidney, I have to search for a scar, which denotes chronic pyelonephritis. Don't let it go like that. Dilatation of the pelvic calicial system has common sites in general and sites that I can see by ultrasound because not all uh, pelvic calcial system dilatation can be well visualized by ultrasound. Uh, here is the pelvic junction, one of the commonest parts, the urethrovasical junction and the posterior urethra. What are the causes of hydronephrosis? Multiple, as you can see, the most important of which is uh, either congenital pelvic junction obstruction that could persist up to adulthood and only present in that uh, time. Stones, of course, and tumors. Okay, dilatation has three stages. First, let's check the normal kidney uh, outline, which is this one. I can see minor calices, I can see major calices, I can see a pelvis and a ureter. In mild hydronephrosis, there is dilatation, minimal dilatation of the major calices, but the calicele necks are not affected. Then I would see hypoechoic color within the hyperechoic sinus, okay? That if color is produced, it could be vascular, but if color is, is placed upon it, does not pick up, okay? Moderate hydronephrosis, I have also dilatation of the minor calices and dilatation of the pelvis, I should see thinning, even if it's mild, of the cortex. M severe hydronephrosis, the cortex is very, very thinned out and atrophic with marked dilatation. This is a case of mild hydronephrosis with a stone obstructing right there. I can see moderate hydronephrosis in this one accompanied by a hydroureter, which means that the, that the obstruction is distal. Same, moderate hydronephrosis, I can still see a, see a cortex. Severe hydronephrosis thinned out cortex. Okay. This is a severe hydronephrosis with hydroureter. And this one shows hydronephrosis and hydroureter. Th this is a double J placed for that purpose. And here is the cause, same patient. There is thickening of the ureter, ureter wall that could be due to a tumor or bilharziasis, okay. Sometimes hydronephrosis complicates by pyonephrosis, infection of the uh, collecting system. And as you can see, I can detect this inf infection by the presence of echogenic debris within the collecting system or fluid levels, okay. I can also detect it by the presence of air, which should not be there, if the infection is anaerobic, okay? So fluid levels or echogenic debris. Renal stones. Renal stone, stones, these are the causes. I cannot differentiate by ultrasound the type of renal stone causing this, uh, uh, the type of renal stone, but I can see a stone. The stone, if it's not, it does not contain lots of calcium, it could uh, uh, not appear, especially if it's within the echogenic sinus. It's echogenic. Within the echogenic sinus, you might not see it. What gives it away is the presence of a shadow. So if I don't have a shadow, I shouldn't say this is a stone. Okay. So this is a small stone with a shadow, larger with a shadow. Okay. Multiple stones within a person. Stone with a shadow, like in classifications, but no shadow. I cannot say that these are stones for sure. They could be, so what do I do? I have to move my probe. So if this was a live session, I would show you, I have to move my probe and change its position in order to detect the presence of a shadow. Okay. A staghorn stone is a stone that occupies all the pelvic calicele system. Sometimes it's difficult to detect. For example, if the shadows are not evident because this is a, an echolucent stone, but this one here is very evident with a very clear, well-demarcated posterior shadow. Nephrocalcinosis. Nephrocalcinosis is one of those things that people uh, just, by, if we are writing a report, we would mention that there is a classification here within the medullary pyramids, right? And then I would say medullary sponge kidney may be present, right? 
Here, a classification of the cortex. This is also of the medulla and causing shadowing. Okay, these are these could or couldn't be stones. Like in this case, this is evident that this is part of a, a universe thing within the kidney. This is nephrocalcinosis. Commonest cause of nephrocalcinosis is hyperparathyroidism, hypervitaminosis, D, uh, medullary sponge kidney of the cortex, acute cortical necrosis, chronic glomerular nephritis. Okay, these are the important causes of cortical and medullary nephrocalcinosis. Okay. Let's check stones within the ureter. This is a, a, a large stone within the pelvic junction causing hydronephrosis. This is, this is very rare. And when I found it, I thought I'd show it to you because usually we cannot detect the mid ureter. We can see the upper part of the ureter or we can see the lower part of the ureter entering into the bladder. But mid ureter is usually obstructed by gases. So this is a mid ureteric stone, very nice. And this is a stone in the distal end of the ureter just before it enters the bladder. Also, urinary bladder stone, this stone has caused echogenic debris within the bladder cystitis, right? And if you can, if you notice, you will realize that the wall of this bladder is not as thin as, for example, this one. Okay, renal masses. Renal masses could either be benign or they could be malignant. Benign renal masses include angiomyolipoma, the commonest, or a renal adenoma. Renal adenoma should not be considered benign, except if it's not growing in size. So a renal adenoma, which I cannot say that it is an adenoma except by CT, ultrasound is not sensitive in this area, can only be uh, diagnosed by CT and then followed up by ultrasound. And if it's growing in size, that's when I have to, to say, let's remove this tumor. But an angiomyolipoma usually, usually is benign and does not transform into malignancy. It could increase in size. And when it's small in size, it's hyperechoic because it contains fat, smooth muscles, and vascular structures. But when it grows bigger, it becomes inhomogeneous. So well-defined, rounded, hyperechoic, small in the cortex, I would say angiomyolipoma. Malignancy is either renal cell carcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma, or metastases, especially from the lung and the ovary, or lymphoma. All these are causes of malignant renal masses. This is an angiomyolipoma, hyperechoic, well-rounded, well-defined, and in the cortex. Same, same. I cannot 100% say that this is a, an angiomyolipoma except by CT, which detects the fat within the, the benign legion. Okay, this is a renal cell carcinoma. Okay, it appears heterogeneous. I did not tell you what it should appear like. I could tell you that again. It appears heterogeneous, hypervascular, deforms the shape of the kidney, contains calcification, cystic degeneration, and could involve the venous structures, whether the renal vein or the IVC. So we'll look again here and see that this has cystic degeneration, another tumor deforming the shape of the kidney, another tumor with calcification. These are all malignant tumors. Another tumor in the uh, renal cell carcinoma, hypervascular. Here it's involving, same patient, involving the IVC. Can you see the IVC? This is the liver. Tumor within the IVC. Another tumor that is hypervascular. One of the reasons I could detect it, okay? This is transitional cell carcinoma, which means a uh, tumor arising from the collecting systems of the kidney. And uh, here is one of uh, a transitional cell carcinoma of the kidney and of the bladder. Hyperechoic uh, irregular in shape. Another transitional cell carcinoma in the bladder. Somebody would tell me, maybe this in the bladder is debris. What do I do? I put, place my probe transverse and I shift my probe up and down and try to check, will this debris move? If it moves, it's not, uh, it's not a tumor, but if it sticks and does not move, this is a tumor mass. Okay, large ones, large ones in the bladder. Okay, how do I do an ultrasound of the bladder? I should place my probe uh, suprapubic, both LS and TS. Uh, in the LS, this is the view that I see. Uh, okay. And this is uh, superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, okay? Here is a, a, a bladder in a normal female, uh, uterus and both ovaries. This is a bladder in a male prostate, and this is the rectum. Okay, why do, should I assess the volume of the bladder? 
Normally, I don't need to assess the volume of the blood, except if I am asked to, to, to measure post-voiding uh, uh, volume, residual post-voiding volume, which is when I should take my measurements. It's important to know how to measure. In the LS, I measure the bladder uh, superior to inferior, and then anterior, posterior in the transverse, and uh, right to left, right? But TS, med uh, two and one in the LS, Okay, and then how do I uh, uh, do the math? I, I multiply the uh, superior in, inferior uh, the, uh, length by width by, by transverse and multiply by 0.5, and then I get the volume of the river. It should not exceed 50 milliliters, even though some studies have said 100 milliliters are acceptable as post-voiding post volume, but it should not exceed 50 in most people. Okay, these are urinary bladder sediments. And as I mentioned, this, for example, is a cystitis because the wall is markedly thickened. See, this is a normal jet, I thought I'd show it to you. And here are sediment that changes with the position of the patient, which I also can do. I don't have to do that. I can ask the patient to move to one side and then I will find change in the sediment. These are pathological lesions of the bladder. This is a circumferential thickening of the bladder wall. This is a a non-circumferential localized thickening, which most probably is a tumor. Circumferential would tell me this is benign due to any cause or a cystitis. Same here, There's uh, uh, this is a long LS of the bladder, normal. So this is thickening, this is localized thickening. Here is a, a, a sediment and here is the prostate causing invagination of the bladder. Right. This I just prepared because somebody asked for the prostate. This is a ultrasound of the prostate, which should be included in any case of a pelvic uh, and uh, abdominal ultrasound. In our unit, we always, always check the prostate. We always check the prostate. So this is how I should place my probe, uh, suprapubic as well, but with angulation. What angulation? The, the, it should be angulated downwards, okay? Not just placed, but angulated downwards. This will give me an excellent view of the prostate, which appears in this manner, LS and TS. This is the TS probe, I should put it like that, and the prostate appears rounded. Okay, do I have to uh, uh, measure the volume of the gland? Yes, I should. I always should me measure the volume of the gland. This is how I should measure it. I should take an also a superior inferior measure. I should take a, a um, an anterior posterior measure and a TS measure, okay, uh, right to left. And I should calculate the volume. The me these measures should not exceed five by three by three, and the volume should not exceed 25, which is multiplication of all three. Now machines always do the calculations for you, so it's very easy. This is benign prostatic hypertrophy. The gland is, is markedly enlarged, but homogenous. This is why we said benign. It's pushing the bladder superiorly. This is invagination of a median lobe, benign prostatic hypertrophy. But this is a malignant prostate because there is breakdown, uh, hyperechogenicity and hypoechogenicity. As you can see here, the same, uh, a very large prostatic cancer. Thank you.